Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Astronomy for Educators. Teaching STEM in summer term is difficult and oftentimes we find that the teaching periods are shorter along it seems with student attention spans. We need activities that will engage hands and minds and meet science standards. We're going to take that on today. Science budgets during summertime are often very limited. So for today, all we're going to need is some clay, two contrasting colors. Uh, I'm using a light white gray and a dark gray clay. And we're going to be making a model of the surface of the moon in clay. Now, if you actually have a telescope, this is going to be a very beneficial exercise. But even if you don't, this makes an excellent learning experience. Let's take a look at how that's done now. Well, here we are at our makerspace, <clears throat> and you can see we've got a fist size, about 300 gram ball of clay in the light color, and then a much smaller, about 20 millimeter ball uh, of clay in a dark color. Any two contrasting colors will work. And we have large, medium, and small marbles, and a uh, golf tee. You can use a nail or a pencil for this. I prefer golf tees because uh, clay tends to get messy. If you don't have bigger marbles, a ping pong ball will do. Uh, but let's take a look and get started. We've taken our fist sized ball of clay and to save time here, I've gone ahead and flattened it out into a nice pancake shape. Now, some people, because this is going to be a surface area, some folks like to go ahead and make this square, and you can certainly square your diagram or your model off later. Don't need to worry about it right now. I'm gonna start out with my large marble, and I'm gonna start creating lunar features from the largest down to the smallest. The very largest lunar features are called maria. These are great big basins, and I'm gonna take my marble here, and I'm rolling out a nice big basin. Is it circular? Eh, sort of, but in nature these things tend to be different shapes and sizes and they change over the millennia. But I've gone ahead and rolled out a fairly good sized basin here. I'm also, because these are very old features and the uh, rims are not really sharp in most places, I'm rolling my marble over and making this smaller. Now, these maria are basins created by large impactors rushing in and striking the moon so hard that they penetrated into the early moon's inner regions. They penetrated through the crust into the mantle and they released a flow of lava that bubbled up and filled this. So I'm taking a piece of uh, just a pinch of dark colored clay here and I'm just pinching it off in my fingers and I'm making a very thin layer that will fit inside my basin here. Now, this represents dark basaltic lavas from inside the moon's interior. The moon's crust is notoriously poor in iron, rich in aluminum and magnesium and silica. And so it's these interior magmas which were darker in color and when we look up at the moon today these are the dark areas that we see at one time this would have been a sea of lava it would have been pretty spectacular to see but most of these are three and a half to almost four billion years old they're very ancient impact structures and so <laughs> there would have been no life on earth at the time certainly no intelligent life to take a look at this. Now, once we make our very biggest basin, we can take our mid-sized marble and we can start to make other large basins. Keep in mind that asteroids are no respecters of, of personal space. Sometimes you'll see a large basin overlaying something else. And generally speaking, large basins are less numerous than smaller basins. The smaller you get, the more there are. And here I'm making two that are together. And I'm making another one up in this corner. There we go. And it's essentially a random pattern. Now, 
Some of these are indeed filled with lava. Some are not. This one may have been a bit uh, newer. This one, let's go ahead and make this a lava filled basin. So we'll insert some dark material in there. Do they always fill the base entirely? No, not always. There's a lot of variability in these structures on the lunar surface. Now, we go from medium-sized craters to smaller craters. Again, small craters are sometimes uh, in different places, and they're different sizes. I can emulate that by changing the depth to which I push the marble, and I'm always wiggling a little bit to give myself something of a crater rim here. And yes, I am creating a lot more of these, and some of them are substantially larger and deeper than others. And when we're looking at the moon, these small craters, these little craters that I'm making here, like this, these might be 80, 90, 100 kilometers across. Now, once we get considerably smaller craters, uh, a lot of times you want to take a look, first of all, and show some evidence of more recent craters. It turns out that the more recent the crater is, the more structure it shows. Older craters tend to slump. The rims get eroded away by impacts from other asteroids. But some of the very newest craters have what we call ejecta blankets that are obvious. And we're going to make these take a look at an imaginary center of the crater and we're going to be drawing lines hashing out directly away radially, radially from that crater. Now, this ejecta blanket is a bright region. If you take a look at photos of the moon, you'll find that some craters are, and yes, the ejecta material does tend to go right over other craters. Sometimes other craters go over the ejecta. But you'll find that these ejecta blankets uh, are not on all craters, but just on some of the newest ones. Ejecta blankets that show up as bright white are temporary because we get a phenomena we call radiation darkening on lunar soils. And what that means is that lunar soils, when freshly fractured, tend to be uh, very bright white but and reflect a lot of light, but over time the sun's radiation darkens those, impacts from meteors erode those, and they start to shrink and go away. Now, some of our biggest craters also feature what we call central mounts. If you've ever seen one of these lovely photographs of a water droplet falling into water and then the center splashing up again, Guess what? If you hit it hard enough, rock does that. And when rock does that, it creates a little uplift section in the center called a central mount. Sometimes it's a single crater peak. Sometimes it's a multiple crater peak. Not all craters have them. Generally, the biggest ones do. And I'm not taking time to make these look triangular, perfect, and again, uh, a lot of times you'll get students who say, oh, well, I can't do that. I have no art skills. Art skills don't matter here. Uh, nature is notoriously sloppy. You can't be too. Uh, and we're just going to go ahead and put some mountain structures in. Now, the other kind of mountain structure that you will often see is lunar mountain chains that actually surround Amaria. On Earth, mountain chains are created when plates come together and then there's uplift. Lunar mountains are created differently. Lunar mountains are actually blocks of material that splash out of a Maria impact. If you can imagine this titanic explosion creating a basin that's 500 kilometers across, and there are blocks of stone, um, 5, 10, 20 kilometers long, that are flying out, and they fly parabolically, and they land, and what do they form? A mountain in a minute. 
these instant mountains on the lunar surface tend to be parallel to the edge of a basin, indicating that they are uh, basically a splash effect. And they're rarely seen completely surrounding Amaria. Rather, we will see that, oh, there's different ones and different ranges surrounding the larger Maria. And some of these mountains are going to be three to five, even 10 kilometers high. Very large, and the ranges can run for hundreds of miles. And there's the Lunar Alps, the Lunar Apennines, there's all sorts of them. I've just created a couple of short mountain ranges here. And now we can go ahead and we can start putting some smaller craters in. Now, if you have small beads or a rounded uh, point, that would work very well. And uh, what can you use for this? Well, you could use a variety of things. A pen cap would work relatively well. And I have one here. And let's see, do I get, now I get kind of a little ring. That's not going to work very well. Let's just go ahead and use my, I'm gonna use my golf tee here. And you can see that, yes, there are craters inside of craters and I'm wiggling this and making some medium sized craters. Sometimes we get a string of craters in a line because a series, an asteroid broke up gravitationally and stayed in a string before it hit the moon. If you wanna see what that looks like in space, you can look up some images of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 from 1992. There are Hubble photographs of that comet that uh, show basically a string of 20 or 25 uh, different objects trailing along, looking like a string of comets. And now I can add some variety of small craters and yes, these are completely random. And I'm pegging over here, bangity bang, there we go. No area is free. There we are, fascinating. One last thing, areas with lava sometimes have rills. One of the Apollo missions went to Hadley Rill. What's a rill? Basically, it's a lava riverbed. So at times, lava would break out and flow sinuously across the surface. And yes, sometimes there were branches and tributaries. And so we've got a rill. And so what do we have now? We've now got a lunar surface model. And this has Maria, large craters, small craters, central mount, ejecta. Some craters have rays, which are basically lines of ejecta which stretch across many hundreds of kilometers. These features are very thin. You only see them at full moon. Crater Tycho in the moon's southern hemisphere is a good example of this. So we've got all kinds of features. Can we go farther? Yes. Now that we've made a model of a landscape, let's go ahead and map it. I'm going to go ahead and create two lines here, two perpendicular lines. So here's one. And yes, I'm just using a rotary cutter. A pizza cutter works great for this. And I'm gonna create one that's perpendicular. Here we go. And now from that, I can go ahead and I can make a line, say every two centimeters. And here we go, I'm making lines. You can already guess where I'm going with this. Yes, latitude and longitude. Uh, you can do this other ways. You can take dental floss, stretch it across the surface of the clay and work it down in with your fingers. You can use a pizza cutter. You can use a hobby knife. You can use a putty knife. You can use all sorts of things that will make very nice lines for latitude and longitude. And 
getting those materials out of the way. Here we go. And I'm proceeding quite quickly here, but you can see where I'm going. And so once you make your latitude and longitude lines here, there's an awful lot of things you can do now. You could, for instance, say, well, gee, let's put some math in. Each of these lines represents a five degree grid. Okay, given the moon's circumference, how big are those squares? How big an area do we have? What do we have in terms of perimeter, diameter, area for craters and features? Using coordinate points, you can do the distance formula, basically Pythagorean triangles, and you can find out how far apart two points are. You can even go ahead see if I have an example here. I don't have one handy. Uh, you can even go ahead and make a map. Ah, here we are. Here's my map. I knew I had it here. You can go ahead. This isn't from this. I just made it, but this is from a previous model. You can go ahead and set up a grid and you can make a map. You can then go ahead and say, okay, kids, name your craters. And on the moon, they're all named for famous mathematicians and scientists, but you can name them for bands, movie stars, cartoon characters, Disney princesses, doesn't really matter. Anything you like, uh, your personal heroes or iconography of your childhood, anything's fair game. You can make up names. And so we can get into map making, geography, perimeter, area. Oh, you want to do volume? That's easy enough. Take an eyedropper and see how many drops of water it takes to fill a crater. By the way, excavated crater volume is a pretty good analog for impact energy. So you can get an awful lot of science into this small model. It's inexpensive, it engages hands and minds, and it can lead you down. You can spend plenty of time with this. You can explore math, geography, geometry, map making, all sorts of avenues. Oh, and if you make a model like this and then you have a chance to look at the moon with a small telescope or even photos on the web, you can start to recognize features. Oh, there's a Maria. Here's a mountain range. Look, a lava-filled crater, a central mount, ejecta. All sorts of features will be visible because there's nothing like bringing a little knowledge to the eyepiece to have a much greater takeaway. I hope you've enjoyed this little program. If you do, please subscribe and like to the Astronomy for Educators channel. There's also an Astronomy for Educators Facebook page, and I welcome your comments and questions in the comments section below. Thank you, everybody. Until next time, this is Dr. Daniel Barth for Astronomy for Educators.